Now is an important time of year. It's when we start thinking about the last year, this last year that we're ending, and thinking towards the future. Things that we have done, things that maybe we have failed in, and then we look to the future and we set our new goals. That's coming right around the corner, and this is the time where we start evaluating those things that come January 1st, these are the things that I'm going to do, these are the things I'm going to change, these are the things I'm going to accomplish. And one thing that, that we have done as a, as a youth group, I posted it today, I've challenged them. And some of them may have seen it, it got published today, so some of them may not have seen it yet, but it is a challenge to read through the Bible in an entire year, and it's something we're going to do together. And if you would like to take part in that, we invite you to, to join us as well. It's through our band app. It's one of our, uh, the main methods of communication. And each day it's going to post the reading and then also a video, if there's a video to go along with it, because it's, in, it's an interactive Bible reading plan through World Video Bible School. Um, and it's a, a terrific program. I've never done it, but I've seen several of the videos, and they are really good. And it's one of our goals is going to be to draw near to God. That's what going to be our, one of our number one goals. It's something we're going to do as a group, and that families can do as a family. It's something that is going to be extremely beneficial to all of us. But it's to come closer to God and to understand what it means to be Christ-like to be a Christian. Um, something we talk about often upstairs in, in the youth classes is it's hard to draw near to God if you don't know who He is. There's only one way to come to know who God is, and that's to be immersed in His Word. That's how He reveals Himself to us. And if you're going to draw near to Him, you have to get in the Word. Um, that's one thing that the psalmist understands in Psalm 119. It is a, a dedication to God's Word and His love for it. And Psalm 119, starting in verse number 1, it said, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep His testimonies, who seek Him with all their heart, who also do no wrong but walk in His ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways be, may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. You can hear his love for God and his word. He says, God, I'm seeking you. I want to know you. I want to know what you desire of me. And one of my favorite uh, passages in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse number 2, 
This is where Azariah is, goes and he meets with Asa. And he says, the Lord is with you while, you're with, while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. If you genuinely want to draw nearer to God, to come to know who he is, he says, if you seek me, you'll find me. That's one of those promises that Jesus also says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 8, right? Where he says, ask and you'll be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. He says, hey, if you seek, you're going to find exactly what you're looking for. If you seek God, you're going to find him. In James chapter 4, verses 7 through 8, it says, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee, flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. See, as you are seeking him, as you are seeking to draw near to him, he moves to where you are. That's a picture that Jesus um, portrays it with his prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, after the son goes and he lives his wild lifestyle, and he says, I need to go back home. He's walking down the road and the father sees him from far off and he doesn't wait for the son just to come and drop down at his feet. He goes to him as soon as he sees him on the road and he embraces and hugs him and welcomes him back home. That's what it is to draw near to God, to seek him. He says, if you seek me, you'll find me. He'll come to you. All you got to do is seek to find. So the question for you is this, are you seeking are you seeking, are you co constantly trying to draw near to God by immersing yourself in His Word and trying to come to find out who He is? I want to challenge all of us to seek God, drawing near to Him by immersing ourselves in His Word throughout this next year. Let's all be standing for our last song, and then we'll dismiss the class. Create in me a clean heart, O oh, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. And cast me so much for everyone that could be here tonight to join in fellowship, to join in your word. And we ask that you would help us to put our minds and our hearts and focus on you, especially as we approach the new year. And a lot of times where people make goals, Father, help us to put the things of the world aside. Help us to put each other's souls and each other's lives uh, ahead of our own uh, selfish ambitions, Father. Help us to put you uh, at the head of everything, Father. And we just Thank you so much for the blessings that we share in. Please be with those who this time of year is tough as they deal with the loss of loved ones or, or hurts or pains and things like that, Father. Help them to feel your love and comfort. Father, we pray for the opportunity to be able to comfort them, our, them ourselves and be a light to them. Be with those who are traveling. Please bless everyone with safe travel and a happy time together and a wonderful time spent with family. And we ask all this in your son's name. Amen.
What's that? <laughs> we'll see how that works. <laughs> Good evening. If you got your Bibles, turn to Genesis, the 30th chapter. Genesis 30. Last week, uh, where we ended, um, and while I'm thinking about it, remember that um, there's the Christmas Eve service at 5 o'clock on Saturday evening, goes from 5 to 5.45. There is um, a, an adult class here in the auditorium only on Sunday morning at 9, and then worship service at 10. Um, and then Wednesday night we are at, next Wednesday night we are at Center Street uh, at 7 o'clock for the citywide service. So kind of, that's a lot of different, you know, things to juggle, but that means we're back, to, to, for, on the first we're back to normal again. So that helps, you know. Um, last week we were talking about um, the deal that Jacob made. Remember, he's gotten his two wives now, he's been worked the seven years for those wives, he wants to leave. And remember, Laban asks him to stay a little long, stay a little longer, because of course the reason he wants him to stay a little longer is, is he has been profiting greatly from having a man that is favored by God being the one to watch over all of his animals. And, and Laban wants to continue to get bigger and richer. And so but, but the begin, uh, uh, about around, around verse uh, 28, 29, 30, 31, Laban makes, a, uh, Laban, he makes a deal with Laban. And if you remember, he, he makes this crazy deal. First of all, he's, he, he doesn't want any pay. Because remember, Laban says, I'll pay you whatever you want. And he doesn't want any money. What did he, anybody remember without looking back at it? What did he end up taking as pay? Spotted sheep, yeah, and goats, and, you know, imperfect, the imperfect animals is what he took as pay, which is, which is, sounds like the dumbest idea in the world, you know, because it's the, it's the animals that people didn't want. And he takes, and he takes, and he says, and, and I'll keep watching your flocks, my, I'll have my sons watch my flock, my flocks. And so he keep, he's working for lousy wages, he's doing it, and it's for six years, this is what he does. And so, th so that's kind of where we are as, as Jacob was there. So let's pick it up um, in verse uh, 34. Agreed, uh, said Laban, to that deal. Let it be as you have said. That same day he removed all the male goats that were streaked or spotted and all the speckled or spotted female goats, all, all that had white on them and all the dark colored lambs, and he placed them in the care of his sons. Then he put a three-day journey between himself and Jacob while Jacob continued to tend the rest of Laban's flocks. Now remember there's one other thing about that deal, by the way, before we keep going. He, he, urged, a, he urged Laban to do what as far as his flocks go? Anybody remember? See, he was supposed to inspect. You can come inspect anytime you want. And it wasn't just that if he found a perfect animal in there, he could take it. He was supposed to do what? accuse Jacob of stealing. So, so I mean, the, the, deal, the deal was a bad deal all the way around. So it's really hard to believe that Laban agreed. But there's, but there's an important thing here, he says. He says he put a three-day journey between himself and Laban as far as their, where their flocks go. Now, now g can you picture their, okay, their three days, a three-day journey apart from each other? Why would three days be important? Yeah, I guess how far out you actually went usually looking for, for uh, uh, places for your, them to be able to graze. About a day's journey away from home. Okay, and so the thing is, if with both of them out three days a week, if they just happened to come in the same direction and went a full day's journey, they were still a full day's journey away from each other. And so there was no way that they were going to intermingle. That's, that's, that was the purpose of the thing. And so, and so Jacob's sons are caring for his inferior flocks. Jacob continues for no extra money to look at Laban's flocks. And so let's keep going in 37. Jacob, however, took fresh cut branches from poplar, almond, and plane trees and made white stripes on them by peeling the bark and exposing the white inner wood of the branches. Then he placed the peeled branches in all the watering troughs so that they would be directly in front of the flocks when they came to drink. When the flocks were in heat and came to drink, they made it in front of the branches, and they bore young that were streaked or speckled or spotted. 
Jacob set apart the young of the flock by themselves, but made the rest face the streaked and dark colored animals that belonged to Laban. Thus he made separate flocks for himself, did not put them with Laban's animals. Whenever the stronger females were in heat, Jacob would place the branches in the troughs in front of the animals so that they would mate near the branches. But if the animals were weak, he would not place them there. So the weak animals went to Laban, strong ones to Jacob. In this way the man grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks, female and male servants, camels and donkeys. Was Jacob being deceitful in how he did all this? Yeah, yes and no, you know. Well, he, let me ask you this. Was Jacob being superstitious? Now, here's an, now this is a, that's a hard question to answer, I, I kind of think, except for this. Did the streaked branches, were the was streaked branches the ones that made the difference? No. What really caused the animals to kind of mate and not mate in this, in this fashion? God did, yeah. You know, um, see, the argument is, is that, remember I told you we were going to come back to the mandrake plants, okay? Remember, Rachel wanted to get some of the mandrake plants that, 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 that Reuben had brought in for, for Leah, and Leah says, what are you going to give me for them? And she says, you can sleep with um, Jacob tonight, and she ends up having two more sons, two more sons, she gets Jacob, right? She got the mandrake plants. Okay, the mandrake plants were purported to be love plants. And if you ate the fruit of the mandrake plant, it was supposed to promote fertility. And she, remember at that point, she's not had any children yet with Jacob, and so she was pretty, getting pretty desperate, and so she wanted to buy those mandrake plants. So I kind of wonder if superstition runs in the family and as Rachel would, took us, tried for, uh, the route of a superstition in order to get pregnant finally, that Jacob jumped on a superstition to try and get the animals that he wanted for his flocks that he might grow. And the dumb thing about it is, is, that, it, is that neither the plant, mandrake plants or the, or the streaked sticks did anything to allow them to prosper or for her to have children. All of it was within God's hands. But Jacob, regardless of whether you look at that, how, why, what he did, Jacob becomes exceedingly wealthy with large, a large family, large number of sheep, goats, camels, donkeys, and all the servants required to take care of all of it. Six years later now, and it's, it's been 20 years since Jacob has been away from home, Isaac and Esau are still alive, but remember his mom has died at this point. And Jacob has unfinished business with both of them. So look, we're going to go to chapter 31, verse 1. Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything our father owned and has gained all this wealth for what belonged to our father. Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude toward him was not what it had been. Then the Lord said to Jacob, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives and I'll be with you. The interesting thing is, in fairness, in fairness Jacob did exactly what he promised. He promised all the strong, all the perfect animals in outward appearance, would stay with Laban, and he would take only the imperfect ones. Now, the fact that God caused the, the, the strength to go towards the imperfect, an, the imperfect animals and, this, and the weakness to go towards the others, you know, um, is, again was God. But he did exactly what he promised to look after Laban. But Laban had counted on the blessings from God toward Jacob to continue to prosper him, not Jacob. All right? And so, and so he starts having second thoughts about having him uh, tend to his flocks. But more importantly, his son starts saying that Jacob, the only reason Jacob is wealthy is because he stole from Laban. Jacob didn't steal from Laban. Jacob took only in pay what he had promised. God did the rest of it. But, they were, but, but Laban, of course, starts listening to them and now starts to question whether Jacob has been honest with him. It doesn't say here that Laban had become impoverished. By the way, it doesn't say that Laban had become impoverished. I mean, it says weak animals, strong animals, but, that, but, he, but there's still a lot of animals that are Laban's, okay? It doesn't say that he suddenly lo had lost everything. It's just that Jacob had passed him and become far wealthier than he was. You know, that's kind of that, you know, that, that really dumb insurance commercial 
It's Christmas morning and the two kids are opening presents and the one kid's ecstatic because he opens this box and it's containing insurance stuff. I don't remember what the company is, but anyway. But you know, is it Liberty Mutual? Okay, and he's always so excited. Well, the other kid, he said, hey, what did you get? And he kicks the tires. He got a bike, you know. Well, didn't, number two got a gift. By the way, the gift I'd have preferred. But number two got a gift. But his despair is because his gift didn't match the quality of the other gift. Now, here's a question, and this one, by the way, is not a joke. Do we despair over the gifts God has given us? Because Satan has succeeded in convincing us that someone else's, gift, else's gifts are better or more numerous. How many, ki- how many with kids in the room? Okay, and I know a lot of you have probably kids grown and gone, but okay, so when the kids were really little, you took all this time to wrap the gifts, you took all this time to do this thing, did you despair at one point that the kid went shh, 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 Wrap up, goes, next gift, you know. I think sometimes we do that with God's gifts. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's great. Next. What have you done for me lately? You know, the thing is, the thing is, I don't think Laban was poor. But he and his sons start to get mad because Jacob is now prosperous. And see, they liked him, they liked him for the better part of 20 years as the, poor, as the poor relative who was tending his flocks and making him richer. Not the rich relative who was outdoing him. Whether it's material, talents, relationships, too many people, instead of praising God for what they have, despair because someone else has more. Despair because there's something in someone else that they're envious of who has something that they think that, that they would like better or would enjoy more. I think when this happens, folks, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to get lost in this, I'm not careful, but I think if what happens is, is that we forget that God knows what we need, that God knows what's best for us, And God's given us the thing that we ought to desire, whatever it is. Not get stuck on what others have. What's interesting here, Jacob takes the time to explain to Rachel and Leah why it is time to go home. Let's pick it up in the next verse. So Jacob sent word to Rachel and Leah to come out of the fields to where his flocks were. He said to them, I see that your father's attitude towards me is not what it was before. Boy, that's an understatement. But the God of of my father has been with me. You know that I've worked for your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me by changing my wages ten times. However, God has not allowed him to harm me. If he said the speckled ones will be your wages, then all the flocks gave birth to speckled young. If he said the streaked ones will be your wages, then all the flocks bore streaked young. So God has taken away your father's livestock and has given them to me in breeding season. I once had a dream in which I looked up and saw all that all the that the male goats mating with the flock were streaked, speckled, or spotted. The angel of God said to me in a dream, Jacob, he said, I said, here I am. He said, look up and see that all the male goats mating with the flock are streaked, speckled, or spotted. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you, where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and go back to your native land. Laban had tried to keep shifting the sand under, underneath his feet to see if he couldn't get, a, get the upper hand on him. Of course, it hadn't worked. God turned each effort into a blessing for Jacob instead. And Jacob wasn't the only one cheated by Laban. L- look at 14. Rachel and Leah uh, replied, do, do we still have any share in the inheritance of our father's estate? Does he not regard us as foreigners? Not only has he sold us, but he has used up what was paid for us Surely all the wealth that God took away from our father belongs to us and our children, so do whatever God has told you. You see, Jacob's concerned because, of course, they're homebodies. They've never been away from home, you know, and is concerned how they'll react to now him talking about leaving and going pretty far away, about 500 miles far away. 
But Laban has apparently squandered the dowry of each of the women who would have gone, should have been going to Jacob and them as payment for the, in, in their, uh, the bridal payment. But it should have been what they received in their marriage. And Laban also seems to have ceased seeing and treating them as his daughters. Now treating them as surely as strangers like he does Jacob. Where did the man who welcomed Jacob as family go? Well, he wasn't getting what he wanted out of him, and he was pretty much done with him. See, but Jacob still has a ways to go in his trust of the Lord. Verse 17, Jacob put his children and his wives on camels. He drove all his livestock ahead of him, along with all the goods he'd accumulated in Paddan Aram, to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. When Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel stole her father's household gods. Moreover, Jacob deceived Laban the Aramean, by not telling him that he was running away. So he fled with all he had, crossed the Euphrates River, and headed for the hill country of Gilead. Okay, some really easy yes or no questions. Was it time for Jacob to, go, to leave Laban's house and go home? Yes. yes. Was it time for Je Jacob to sneak away? Yes. No. Was it likely Laban would have tried to get him to stay longer? Yes. That actually falls into the category of course, I think. Was God capable of helping Jacob leave if Jacob had just simply put his trust in him? The answer is yes. Two wrongs I see here. First of all, Rachel may have felt justified because of what she and Leah say about how they now are treated, what happened to the dowry for their marriage. You know, all those things were gone. May have felt justified because of those actions to steal the household gods. Was she? No. No. Jacob may have felt trapped by Laban, which kind of makes sense because, you know, six years before, oh, just stay a little longer, you know, justified for sneaking out. But actually, by the way, we'll, we'll see later here if we get to it, Jacob actually knew he was in the wrong by sneaking out because he ends up apologizing for it to Laban, admits to it. It takes more than a week for Laban to get news that they're gone because remember how far were the flocks away from each other? three days. And so the thing is, is it takes new time for the word to get to Laban that he's gone and then time for him to catch up. So it takes a little over a week for him to catch up to the fleeing Jacob. Verse 22, on the third day Laban was told that Jacob had fled. Taking his relatives with him, he pursued Jacob for seven days and caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. Then God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream at night and said to him, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country of Gilead when Laban overtook him, and Laban and his relatives camped there too. Then Laban said to Jacob, what have you done? You've deceived me, and you carried off my daughters like captives in a war. Why did you run off secretly and deceive me? Why didn't you tell me? So that I could send you away with joy and singing to the music of timbrels and harps. You didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren or my daughters goodbye. You've done a foolish thing. I have the power to harm you, but last night the God of your father said to me, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now you've gone off because you long to return to your father's household, but why did you steal my gods? Laban kind of takes the, the um, attack mode here, okay, as, as, as the road to take. And he tries to gain the upper hand by rebuking Jacob for sneaking off. But here's the funny thing in that line. He says, he says, why did you deceive me <laughs> by carrying off my daughters like captives in a war? Laban had been deceiving Jacob for years, cheating him at every turn. I mean, by the way, 13 years ago, the big deception, right? He thinks he's marrying Rachel, and what does he, who does he find under the veil when he, it's his wedding night, but it's, his, it's her sister. I mean, Jacob had been deceiving him all along, and I, I love the line, you know, isn't it sometimes the one who squawks the loudest about something is the one who's kind of guilty of it, actually? And it's, that, it's their problem. So, so he says, you've, de you've deceived me, you know, and I, I, I wanted to say right back, and you have done what, you know? Do you think Laban would have really sent Jacob off with singing and joy? Why would he say that? See? Well, he's trying to give himself the, 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 the good side, right? Well, you know, you did all the bad things. You did all the bad things. Look at me. I would have sent you off with joy and singing. You know? 
And then the line, by the way, I have the power to harm you. Now, what did he just say about what God said? See, he said, don't do anything, right? Just don't do anything. And he says, now I have the power to harm you. That's bluster. But finally, he actually gets down to what's actually bothering him. All of the arrest was window dressing until the last line, why did you steal my gods? All Laban is showing here is one, his, remember, he's showing his, his, has no, gained no faith in the God of Abraham because he says, your God appeared to me last night and said, right? And then the other thing is, is that he's showing here his faith in his phony idols. Remember, I told you a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it's a little bit longer than that, but it's somewhere here in Genesis that I told you that people thought God, thought of God's territorially, right? Remember? Okay, and so the reason they had idols were because you needed a specific from that God there to have any, any work for you, to have any play for you, all right? And so, so the thing is is, is, is when you went away from home, because remember, Jacob struggled with this. When you went away from home, see, he thought he was leading the God of his dad and his grandfather behind when he first ran away from home, see? And that's when God appears to him and says, I'm with you, I'll be with you, see? And he, he gets a different perspective on God because everybody thinks this, okay? And so Laban thinks that they've taken away, his, they've, they've taken away the power of his gods because they're not, no longer there in his hands, in his territory. Now, before we look at Jacob's indignant reply, we need to look at verse 31, spend some time there. Jacob answers Laban, I was afraid because I thought you would take your daughters away from me by force. Now here's the interesting thing. In one of the most plainly honest statements Jacob ever makes in the whole time we have Jacob's story, he expresses the doubt, his doubt, and he expresses the doubt on a couple of levels that I want us to kind of take a look at. All the wealth he's acquired, all the children and servants that are his, it was to Jacob a thing that could be here today and gone tomorrow, right? And in truth, his fear was that God could do nothing about it, that God couldn't stop it. Guys, we all have doubts at times. There's some of us who actually, and it's, it's, it's the scariest struggle of all for us as believers, because we think we're supposed to grow to a point where we no longer have them. Who's the, what was it the guy said to Jesus? I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Well, was he two-faced? No. He's honest. Because both are true. We all do have doubts. We, we know that everything in this world is temporary. But at times I think we allow Satan to convince us that it's out of God's hands that it's circumstance that caused the loss, that it's circumstance that caused the better, that it's just the happenstance of this world. And scarily enough, by the way, there's religion today that teaches that. That it's not God's control. It's the, it's the, the whims of nature that we live in. But even as, a, as, a see, as I see a statement or a, a doubt in Jacob's statement, I think there's a positive to his statement as well. For while he's admitting that he had doubts about the outcome, that is something that, in that, that's something that he can take to the Lord, seek to put it in his hands, and allow his strength to overcome his doubts. And folks, I, I don't know a better way to put it than that for all of us. The doubts do come. Because Satan's working at us tirelessly to try and bring them. But the thing is, we also have a belief in a God who can do all things. And regardless of how I doubt about my faith, I know there's a God who can see me through beyond my doubt. I know there's a God who can carry me through the struggle that I can't overcome. That God has the answer for it. And then he proves that he had no idea what Rachel did. Verse 32, but if you find anyone who has your gods, that person shall not live. In the presence of our relatives, see for yourself whether there's anything of yours here with me, and if so, take it. Now, Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the gods. Jacob obviously is so completely unaware of what Rachel has done, but more than that, he's incensed at Laban because Laban 
has come and accused him of this theft. I, clearly, remember that we were talking about it, you know, earlier. The, 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 and I, and I, as soon as I start this, I, I always struggle with his name. The fellow who, who swore to God that he would sacrifice the first thing that comes out of his house. Is that Jephthah? Yeah? Thank you. Hey, it just came to me. You know, I can tell you. I don't know why, Robert, looking at you and I got Jephthah. I don't know what it was. You know, <laughs> I don't know what that was. But, but Jacob is unaware. If he had known, I don't, obviously I don't think he'd been willing to sacrifice Rachel with a, a no turning back kind of statement. You know, whoever you, whoever you find it on, that person won't live. But it does get me to something. It would be great if we had all the patience, all had the patience in this country in particular, to wait until all the facts come to light before declaring our condemnation or our support of somebody. In the day we live in, with instant access, 24-hour news, people take sides immediately. People are condemned in the moment, written off as guilty regardless of what might come to light later. So Jacob, Laban goes into Jacob's tent, into Leah's tent, into the tent of the two female servants, but found nothing. After he came out of Leah's tent, he entered Rachel's tent. Rachel had taken the household gods, put them inside her camel's saddle, was sitting on them. Laban searched through, through everything in the tent, but found nothing. Rachel said to her father, don't be angry, my Lord, that I can't stand up in your presence. I'm having my period. So he searched, but could not find the household gods. Now, the two things I'm sure of is, is that it must have really chafed Jacob that he actually went to the thing of actually looking through all their, rifling through all their tents. Rather than, again, again, rather than giving him the benefit of the doubt as a company, somebody who'd been working for him for 20 years, that he hadn't done it. Do we give fellow believers the benefit of the doubt? Some of you are shaking your heads yes, and some of you immediately shook them no. This sounds like something we need to talk about. Do we give each other the benefit of the doubt? Sometimes I think we struggle with it. Should we give them the benefit of the doubt? How are we supposed to take each other as believers? That I doubt your faith until you prove it to me? Or I accept in faith that you are who you say you are until your actions prove otherwise about you. Which way? Yeah, the problem is, is I, most of society does the first. They doubt your veracity until you can prove otherwise. And I think the church is starting to fall into the same trap. But you know what? Not just fellow believers. Should we give others the benefit of the doubt as well? demonstrate that our faith allows us to give them a chance to prove otherwise before we automatically look to condemn. That's what Laban was doing. The other thing is I see is Rachel here. And I'm going to go into the whole circumstance of what she tells her father that's a lie, another lie, okay? But might this not have been the right time to confess? to clear the air with her father. By the way, at the same time, clearing the name of her husband, who's the one who's been accused of this. Instead, she doubles down on her sin by lying to her father about the time of the month it is to, make, to get herself out of the first lie of stealing the gods. One of the best known Psalms is Psalm 1. And that first verse is, blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked, stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. The psalmist starts out by basically saying, there really is, there's not such a thing as a standalone event that sin is. That sin is an, not only an individual event, but it is a door open for more. You know, I used to hate the slippery slope concept. Well, if you do this, it might lead to this, it might lead to that. The trouble is, that's exactly what happens with sin. Now, Rachel's the proof of it. Without repentance and confession, all it does is lead to start to more and more sin to cover up where we are, where we already have been. Laban enters Rachel's tent. I think it's an opportunity that God gives Rachel to confess her sin or to compound that sin with another. 
You know, the truth is we are given those kind of opportunities every day of our life. The opportunity to either compound the, the, the things we've done that displeases God or to, or to stand up and to profess before God that we've done wrong, that we've done what we shouldn't have done, to bow knee before the Lord. And by the way, I don't have this anywhere in my notes, but there's, become, there's kind of come a thing in religion today you know, somebody asked, some, some people ask me, and it's kind of on occasion, but they ask me whether it bothers me that nobody comes forward on Sundays. Well, actually, very few people come forward anywhere on Sundays anymore. But I, but I, don't, I don't think, that doesn't bother me from a personal standpoint. It only bothers me from this. Paul certainly urges us all to, to confess to the Lord, to seek forgiveness of our sins, because that's the forgiveness we need, yes? But why in the world, then, does he urge us to confess to one another. Confession comes with a, is meant to come with a vulnerability where I put myself in a position of needing, to, of needing repentance, but also put myself in a position of honestly where I am. I think people have stopped coming forward because what happened too often in church was somebody would come forward, would confess what was happening to them, and then all of a sudden everybody started looking at him differently. Start saying, you know, I've known, I've known that guy for 20 years. I can't believe he did that. What a disappointment he is. And suddenly friends that they thought were friends suddenly ran away from them. You know, Paul didn't urge everybody who, has, who receives somebody's confession of sin to condemn them. There are one another passages that also covers that too, about bearing one another's burdens, lifting one another up, loving one another, caring for one another. Do I need to go on? The fact of the matter is, is that I think the reason that we don't see much confession anymore is because we've been so beaten up by it, by other people, that we're gun shy to do it anymore. There's another, another reason about not coming in front of the whole church, I think, anymore, and that's because what you really need to do is confess in front of people that know you well already. All the one and other passages hinge on personal relationship. I standing in front of 500 people who I don't really know, 90% of them, almost at all, I don't know that that's necessarily the right place for this to take place. But confessing to one another is meant to take place, folks, in the Lord's church. Because God asked us to. But in his righteous indignation, Jacob opens up on Laban. Jacob was angry, verse 36, and took Laban to task. What is my crime, he asked Laban. How have I wronged you that you hunt me down? Now that you've searched through all my goods, what have you found that belongs to your household? Put it here in front of your relatives and mine and let them judge between the two of us. I've been with you for 20 years now. Your sheep and goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten rams from your flocks. I did not bring you, you animals torn by wild beasts. I bore the loss myself. You demanded payment for me for whatever was stolen by night or day. And by the way, that's actually the deal that Jacob made with him, remember? This was my situation. The heat consumed me in the daytime and the cold at night sleep fled from my eyes. It was like this for the 20 years I was in your household. I worked for you 14 years for your two daughters, six years for your flocks. You changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, you would surely have sent me away empty-handed. But God has seen my hardship and the toil of my hands, and last night he rebuked you. We've been talking for about three weeks as we watch the change that kind of comes over Jacob, the kid, the scared kid who ran away from home because his older brother wanted to kill him, and how he has grown in the Lord. And I do think that this rebuke that takes place here is a part of that, because he basically has been the doormat of Laban for 20 years and has kept his mouth shut. Now, I think he was supposed to do that in a lot of ways because he was supposed to demonstrate the heart of a servant but now what he does is he stands up and boldly confronts Laban for 20 years of being wronged and taken advantage of. He directly counters Laban's statements. Laban goes, I would have sent you away with joy and singing. <laughs> Jacob says, if God hadn't been with me, you'd have surely sent me away empty-handed. And they wear their, the other side, uh, remember the doubts that I said he expressed when he said I was afraid and I ran away because of it? Here he's 
instead says, but God has seen my hardship, the toil of my hands, and last night he rebuked you. There's no question we experience doubt. Satan is too good at what he does to not have that happen. It's not a question of if we will live in those doubts. It's only a question of if we will live in those doubts or let our faith in the Lord overcome them. Laban answered Jacob, the women are my daughters, the children are my children, and the flocks are my flocks. All you see is mine. Yet what can I do today about these daughters of mine or about the children they have born? Come now, let's make a covenant, you and I, and let it serve as a witness between us. I mean, you got to love Jacob. I, I hope nobody, nobody is one in the audience, okay, or watching online. But he make a great used car salesman. You know, he, he's a guy that they, he, he could have sold ice to Eskimos, you know. I mean, he, you know, he, uh, he and he, and boy, and he, he just does not, I mean, he never, let, he never lets up on, I have the upper hand, I have the upper hand, I'm the one in charge, I have the upper hand. The truth is, he's lost. None of it is his any longer. He tries to save f- face by claiming to be the peacemaker, offering to make this covenant with Jacob about the peaceful transfer of all that Jacob now has being coming from Laban. One of the differences between the two men at this point, Laban thought that he was losing what had been his. Jacob knew now without doubt that he was caretaker of what is the Lord's. And we're about at, we're going to be out of time and I I want to t- I want to take this the uh, the the covenant that they make and and spend some time on it so I don't want to go that far or any further. One of the great growths in Jacob is understanding, see, all of those things that he fought for to be his, the blessing, the birthright, the wives, children, the, you know, the animals, I mean, all these things. He finally, I believe, has grown to be the man that his father and his grandfather were, who understood that all of it was the Lord's anyway, and that he was merely the caretaker of it. Folks, every, every one of us have things in our lives. We have people that are important to us. We have possessions that God has graced us with. We have a church family. We have a job. We have all the different things that we have. The truth is, none of them are ours. When we died to self to be made alive in Christ, we died to the rights to own. Because the dead don't own anything. It's all God's. Maybe one of the greatest struggles in American Christianity is the tug of war that Jesus talks about when he said the love of money is the root of all evil because there's so much to possess in this country. And yet what, what it is instead, it's a great blessing from the hand of God to make a difference in other people's lives, to be a difference maker in our own household, to be a difference maker in the workplace by showing them it's not the things that matter. It's God Almighty and His Son who died for our sins. To me, Jacob has grown a lot. And really, what we'll talk about, I want you to go ahead and read through, and you have a couple weeks to do it, but go back and go and read through 31 and the rest of 31 and 32, chapters 31 and 32. And we're going to look at this covenant that they make with each other. And we're going to, I'm going to ask a question that I asked Lynn at, at, at dinner. The difference between making peace and making a truce. Which one happens here? And which one happens most often in our relationships with one another? So that will give you something to kind of mull over, hopefully, before two weeks from now. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll be done. Heavenly Father, I love you so much. We thank you for another time where we're freely able to go in and look at these accounts of other people who seek to have faith in you but also struggle, seek to have certainty in your strength and your power but also have doubts. And Lord, we do too. We have a lot of people right now that are questioning because of loss in their family, others that are struggling because of relationships that have been broken, work that's gone away, health issues. And the question so often that we're asking is, why, Lord? But as we remember, Job asked that same question 
as well. Why did it happen to me? And you answered him and overwhelmed him with an answer that he couldn't comprehend. It's not why it happens to us. Father, help us to remember it's who can carry us through it. It's not the what of what happens. It's putting our faith in you regardless of the circumstances in this life and allowing you to be first in everything. Father, we're so grateful for this family that you allow us to be a part of, grateful for its leadership, grateful for this time that we are graced with each and every week where we can open up your word and see in others our own struggles and the solution to them by leaving it in your hands. Father, we ask it as this week uh, comes to a close and we ask as we begin uh, our holiday celebration by remembering your son, by remembering that great gift given, his life on the cross for our sins. That wouldn't have happened if he hadn't come in in that humble way to be able to look each and every person in the eye and be one of us, except for the only one who's perfect. As we begin our holiday celebration by remembering him, may that embolden us to be a little bit more like Jacob, to be bold in our faith, be bold in how we stand for you to be bold in the message of the gospel to those who need to hear it. Father, we thank you so much for your mercy, your grace, your kindness to us each and every day and the blessings that we receive. I want to echo what was said in the prayer during the devotional that there's so many of our members that are traveling. The weather in so much of the country is bad right now. Father, we need your hand on them. We seek safety for them to be able to go and to enjoy the holiday with their family and friends and to be able to safely come back to the church family here. We put it in your hands and your hands alone because we put our trust in you. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. And we are done. Thank you very much. your unfailing love. The cross has spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart could fully know. How glorious, how beautiful you are. Beautiful displayed for all to see. The beauty of your majesty awaits my heart to see. How much